All right, thanks for coming this morning. I'm going to uh, give grand rounds on uh, pelvic neuromodulation. So the, uh, the unique ability to controllably void or, or inhibit voiding is um, what sets humans apart from, from other mammals, as Derek uh, realized when he was three years old and uh, went on to become a urologist. So today I want to I talk about uh, the definition of, of neuromodulation. Um, this is actually a bit backwards. I'm going to then go on to talk about some of the clinical aspects and some of the uh, trials and, uh, and um, literature on efficacy and safety, and then um, move on to neurophysiology and talk about uh, what we know about the mechanism of neuromodulation. So if you look up the word neuromodulation in Stebbins, it's not there. It's kind of a contrived word. Um, if you go a bit further, uh, there are some uh, some societies, uh, some some uh, organizations that have formed around neuromodulation. Um, there's a long-winded uh, definition by the North American Society, Therapeutic Alteration of Activity in the Central Peripheral or Autonomic Nervous Systems, electrically or pharmacologically by means of implanted devices or there's uh, I prefer the urologic definition which is stimulating nerves to improve bodily functions and symptoms uh, it's neuromodulation is uh, kind of a wide spectrum of um, of uh, treatments and it can occur at any kind of uh, point along the neuroaxis from the brain down to the neuromuscular junction and uh, it can either involve kind of electric nerve stimulation or uh, drug delivery. It has applications in a wide uh, range of fields outside of urology. Uh, a pacemaker is a common example. And, uh, you know, a more dramatic example is uh, diaphragmatic pacemakers and uh, ventilatory failure. In urology, there have uh, been numerous types of neuromodulation studied. Uh, these, have, these range from the historical to the more, um, more contemporary. Um, and today we're going to be mainly talking about sacral root stimulation, um, which is one of the FDA approved uh, uh, modes of neuromodulation, um, which is the inter interstim device is the approved um, uh, method. And it's an implantable uh, uh, device there is another FDA approved uh, neuromodulation device which is a uh, peripheral percutaneous nerve stimulator uh, which stimulates the, uh, the tibial nerve uh, around the ankle. It's the Stoller, um, Marshall Stoller device, but we won't be talking about that. So this is the interstim device. Uh, just, um, just to mention that neuromodulation seems to be kind of uh, growing and becoming more present in several organizations and societies and has a bit, of a, a bit more of a research presence. The uh, Society of Urodynamics and Female Urology is now, the, uh, is now kind of uh, combined with the International Society of Pelvic Neuromodulation. And uh, as of the last kind of uh, uh, SUFU meeting, it's now the combined SUFU and Pelvic Neuromodulation meeting. And there seems to be Canadian society, societies popping up. Um, and I think these are um, not just urologic, but uh, they kind of they encompass all the fields. And I think anesthesia has a big presence uh, in neuromodulation for chronic management of chronic pain and whatnot. So we'll just jump right into some of the clinical aspects of uh, pelvic neuromodulation. Um, basically, the target population for uh, for neuromodulation is. Uh, people with idiopathic voiding dysfunction, either overactive uh, bladder, wet or dry, and, uh, and underactive bladder or idiopathic urinary retention. Uh, those are the FDA-approved indications. There's also some off-label uses. Um, the most common would be IC or chronic pelvic pain. And then there's uh, kind of some more investigational expanding indications. And it basically offers second-line therapy for people that have failed uh, conservative management with either behavioral dietary uh, modification, um, biofeedback, or, or pharmacotherapy. 
So as I said, the, uh, these are the FDA approved indications either for overactive bladder or idiopathic retention. And then there's uh, some expanding uses. So just a note on, uh, on a couple of notes on the clinical evaluation of um, the patient with, that presents with voiding dysfunction. Um, the history is, uh, is quite important. You want to detail their, uh, their urinary symptoms and try to characterize uh, whether it's a storage disorder uh, uh, or an emptying disorder or possibly both. Um, and uh, you want to get a history of any triggering events, uh, diet and previous surgery, trauma. And, uh, and you also want to outline what treatments they've tried um, and, and, uh, and questionnaires and voiding diaries often help to uh, quantify uh, symptoms and um, basically after after history you kind of want to have a, a working diagnosis and then um, uh, on physical examination uh, it, it's been uh, said that on inspection you, you can sometimes uh, with people with uh, pelvic floor dysfunction or spasm you can sometimes uh, know that they have trouble sitting in your office and you want to in females examine for any demonstrable stress or urinary incontinence, hypermobility, or prolapse. Uh, neurologic and pelvic floor examinations are important. Um, your analysis in everyone's cytology in selected cases, people you know, with a history of smoking or uh, severe uh, urgency. Um, your dynamics is basically indicated in those that have failed previous uh, uh, medical management or conservative therapy. They have a mixed picture. Uh, they've had previous surgery or uh, you're suspecting that there may be something neurologic uh, going on. Um, cystoscopy, um, if, if they've, again, failed previous, it's kind of the same indications as for your dynamics, but also if they're presenting with uh, retention, is pretty much an absolute indication to, to scope. And, um, and uh, imaging, you want to rule out any, anything simple and reversible, any stones, um, and ch just check their upper tracks as a baseline. And, uh, and, you know, MRI, again, if you're worried about uh, neurogenic, uh, neurologic lesion. So uh, just to talk about the two main disorders that are treated with uh, pelvic neuromodulation briefly. So um, overactive bladder is, uh, uh, there's been new terminology um, outlined by the International Continent Society as of 2002. And um, uh, basically overactive bladder is, symptoms is divide, divide, uh, defined by symptoms and that those are frequency urgency uh, and they can be wet or dry and the other key part of the clinical definition is that there's no um, there's no etiology that's um, uh, identifiable um, and uh, the, basically um, it's quite uh, prevalent uh, up to you know 16 to 17 percent in men or women and, uh, and a lot more, more of the uh, women than the men are actually uh, incontinent with overactive bladder. And we don't know much about the natural history and the response to conservative uh, treatments. Um, uh, that data seems to just kind of not be there at this point. And uh, on the other side of the coin, idiopathic retention. Um, this is basically urinary retention um, with no identifiable cause, no anatomic obstruction. Uh, and um, uh, and on uh, urodynamics, usually they they don't have the ability to to form a, a meaningful bladder contraction, and uh, it's also known as Fowler sy syndrome in uh, younger females. Um, and uh, in males, there things to consider would be possibly bladder neck dysfunction. Uh, again, you wouldn't see anything abnormal cystoscopically. The diagnosis is by video urodynamics, and you see the, the, the uh, bladder neck um, uh, into going into spasm when the patient tries to avoid. And it can be treated with medically or, or with a conservative TERP. Uh, and then most people with men with idiopathic retention have bashful bladder. And uh, if they're refractory to conservative treatment, then they would be candidates for neuromodulation. So again, overactive bladder or retention, uh, pe people that have failed conservative management uh, are candidates for neuromodulation. And uh, of uh, note, people that have failed other types of uh, neuromodulation, particularly peripheral uh, uh, tibial nerve stimulation, are, are still candidates for 
pelvic neuromodulation, and even people that have ha had previous Botox for um, overactive bladder can still get um, sacral uh, root stimulation. So there's been uh, no identifiable clinical uh, predictors of who will who will su uh, succeed with uh, pelvic neuromodulation. No urodynamic factors, no uh, patient factors identified. The only uh, factor that predicts successful outcome of pelvic neuromodulation is uh, a successful test phase, which we'll, which we'll talk about. Um, the contraindications to uh, pelvic neuromodulation are absolute or uh, any abnormalities of the sacrum or uh, sacral nerves. Uh, if the patient is unable to, to deal with the device mentally, um, and again, if they've had a failed uh, trial stimulation. And uh, uh, neurogenic bladder is, is actually a, um, a relative contraindication. There's actually a lot of data now that neuromodulation can help uh, people with, with neurogenic bladders. So it's a two-step process. The first uh, stage is the uh, test stimulation. Uh, both of these stages can be done under uh, uh, combined sedation and, and local anesthetic. It's a minimally uh, invasive um, procedure. The test phase is a percutaneously implanted uh, um, electrode. Um, you aim for S3 and you use fluoroscopic guidance and also uh, clinical parameters to help you determine whether you're, you're there. You'll, you get an anal wink and a great toe dorsiflexion on that side if you're in the right place. You use a tined uh, lead which has little hooks on it and keeps it in place. It prevents migration during the, the test phase uh, which cuts down on uh, uh, non-responders and the, the test phase goes on for uh, one to four weeks. You hook up the electrode to an external stimulator, you get the patient to, to keep avoiding diarrhea, you have their baseline avoiding diarrhea and then you compare the two. So this is uh, what the test phase looks like. And then uh, if they respond, if they have a significant response, which is a greater than 50% uh, improvement in their, in their uh, symptoms as per the voiding diary, you go ahead and, and implant uh, the, the, uh, the pulse generator. It's usually in the upper buttock um, or lower abdomen. You put it in a subcutaneous pouch. So the efficacy of uh, neuromodulation, um, there's very few uh, randomized trials that are out there. There's several case series and there's not much long-term data. Um, the best um, randomized control trials that, that are available are by the uh, Sacral Nerve Stimulation Study Group, which is a, a large multi-center group. Um, there's 16 centers included and they pool all, all their data together and they basically had a, a, a they did a few trials on a few different patient populations. The first when they did was for patients with refractory urge incontinence. Um, uh, they excluded any patients with neurologic uh, conditions, and that's one of the reasons that um, uh, Interstim isn't um, FDA approved for, for patients with uh, neurogenic bladder. Um, so they uh, had 155 patients that underwent test stimulation. Only about uh, half of the patients had a significant improvement on the test stimulation and then underwent su subsequent uh, implantation of the device. 80% um, of the patients were, were women and almost all patients had refractory, uh, were refractory to previous uh, therapies. Over half had previous uh, surgery. So they, um, they basically measured uh, effect based on voiding diary, uh, quality of life questionnaire, and your dynamic uh, parameters. And they also uh, took the, um, the uh, people that, um, uh, they took a, a subset of people that, um, uh, that got implanted and took them off, uh, uh, they turned the stimulator off for a time and they c compared them to when they were on the, uh, the stimulator. So uh, based on uh, avoiding diary effect, there was about a 75 to 85 percent uh, improvement. Uh, sorry, 75 to 85 percent of patients um, um, had a greater than 50 percent improvement in their uh, avoiding diary parameters at 18 months. And then when these patients, when some of these patients were taken off or deactivated, um, they all kind of went back to their baseline uh, scores. 
and uh, in terms of the quality of life questionnaire, um, all had uh, improved perceptions of, of uh, overall physical health status and no patients uh, got worse. Uh, and there were no changes on in urodynamics, but a lot of the patients didn't have any, any urodynamic abnormalities on baseline. Um, they did a, a group of patients with uh, just urgency frequency, so these are basically dry, overactive bladders, and uh, they found uh, kind of a lower uh, success rate. Um, and this is possibly because um, these pa because these patients uh, weren't uh, wet. They're they're they kind of started at um, with a disease that wasn't as profound, and so it's, you, know, you may not get an effect that's a, as uh, as uh, large, um, but they also had uh, significant improvements in quality of life. And uh, they, they did a similar study in patients with idiopathic retention. Um, they had two-year follow-up in this group, and uh, they found a 70% uh, greater than a significant response rate, and 60% uh, of patients uh, came off CIC altogether. In terms of durability, there's only really one uh, case series that has uh, greater than two-year follow-up, and this is a group of 45 patients that had uh, almost four, uh, four years of follow-up, and at that time there was a 60% uh, response rate at four years. Um, and uh, the most common reasons for, for failure in the remaining 40% were um, recurrent lead migration or, or breakage, so technical problems. Uh, or explantation of the device for infection. Um, and all of the failures occurred within 18 months. So if they went got past 18 months, then they were going to have a, a good durable result. Uh, just a couple of words on the expanding indications for neuromodulation. Uh, chronic public pain, or ICE, is probably the most common uh, non- or off-label use for, per, for neuromodulation. Um, there was a study by Cometer in 2003 he had a case series of 25 patients that met uh, NIDDK IC criteria and failed behavioral therapy and hydro extension, uh, six month uh, trial of uh, conservative therapy. They, the, uh, they all uh, had successful uh, test stimulation phase, and he basically measured um, uh, avoiding, avoiding diary parameters, voided volumes, and uh, their IC symptom and problem index scores. And uh, the, show up all that well, but um, there, were, there were improvements in almost every uh, voiding diary score, um, which kind of says that these patients probably also have overactive bladder, um, but they're also, uh, their, their pain scores improved significantly, and uh, their IC symptom index and, and pain index, or problem index, uh, improved as well. So um, in terms of uh, safety, um, the uh, the most common complication is uh, is pain at the uh, uh, at the um, implant is at the um, um, implanted uh, uh, site the generator site and uh, lead migration is also fairly common and this uh, commonly results in uh, a decreased response uh, in uh, uh, to to the neuromodulation um, of note. Um, Adverse changes in, in voiding function are very, uh, very rare. You don't often put someone in retention or give them an overactive bladder. Um, there's a, uh, a, a summary by uh, Siegel who summarized all the data from the three trials, the uh, sacral nerve sim stimulation study group, and basically divided the complications into complications of the test phase or post-implantation complications. And overall complication rate was you know, approaching 20% in, in both groups. During the test phase, it's most common that you get lead migration and technical problems. And uh, post-implantation, you most commonly get pain at, at the site, and that's usually treated by relocating the, the device somewhere else, uh, or you get infection, which requires explantation. Um, and uh, they had a 30, uh, one third uh, reoperation rate after the implantation. Most of that was for um, for uh, uh, moving the uh, the generator for pain. Uh, there's a Cleveland Clinic series which uh, uh, reviews 167 patients, 
and they, they had some expanded indications for their um, neuromodulation. They had two-year follow-up, and um, they had a high uh, response rate to test stimulations. About three quarters responded, and um, and of uh, of the 28% of non-responders, um, they uh, didn't get uh, a, um, they got uh, sorry the uh, 28 non-responders. Uh, just um, uh, didn't respond to the test stimulation either just because they didn't respond uh, and a slight uh, minority uh, actually got infection of the uh, of the test lead. This shows that infection isn't a common complication of the of the uh, of stage one and uh, about 10 percent required revision of the uh, of the percutaneous uh, lead because they uh, they had you know just not quite a 50 percent reduction in symptoms and so you want to get them to that 50% to see if you can get them to the implantation uh, and it's usually uh, because of migration or technical problems. In stage two uh, they had uh, only a 10% explantation rate and that was mostly for infection and uh, of the revisions most were uh, for mechanical reasons. The revisions for infection eventually got explanted. So generator site infection the best management is explantation. Salvage is not often successful. And uh, if there's just pain at the generator site, no, in, no infection, um, relocating the, uh, the generator is the, is the treatment. And if uh, you have someone that's been implanted, they're responding, and then over time they, they get a decreased response, uh, things to think about would be you know, uh, lead migration, uh, but also um, actually a technical problem with the uh, uh, with the device and uh, you can do impedance testing uh, and you're basically looking for uh, either high impedance which would Im imply um, uh, no current uh, going through the uh, circuit or um, low impedance or short circuit which would, would mean body fluid or, or tissue eroding into the uh, system and, and the current flowing down the path of least resistance and not actually going through the uh, end of the electrodes. So um, the future uh, clinical trials are going to uh, um, look at special populations, the use of neuromodulation in pediatrics and dysfunctional elimination syndromes, and also as well uh, looking at uh, neuromodulation in neurogenic bladder. And there are some uh, kind of new and expanding indications in uh, erectile dysfunction. I think Tom Liu has, um, has been looking into that, and there's some, um, some data coming out. And then other um, uh, research is going to basically look at technical advances and, and improvements. Um, there's a, uh, a series that I just wanted to talk about in uh, uh, looking at neuromodulation in the neurogenic population. They had nine uh, women with neurogenic bladder and incontinence. Um, over half had a spinal cord injury. And uh, they all had neurogenic detrusor overactivity on, uh, on neurodynamics and were refractory to anticholinergics. Of note, five of them had uh, sphincter dyssynergia. They had 40-month follow-up, which is actually quite long for uh, this for neuromodulation literature. And uh, I think eight out of nine had improved neurodynamic and cl clinical parameters. Uh, they all had to have a greater than 50% uh, response in, in, uh, to get implanted in the first place. Um, and uh, only one patient actually had a dynamic increase in detrusor overactivity. So it looks, you know, from this small series that even a neurogenic bladder um, neuromodulation um, can be useful. Um, the one caveat is that the, the neurologic lesion has to be a, a stable one. And uh, in children, um, it's been uh, used for uh, severe dysfunctional elimination syndromes. Um, these kids are all you know, refractory dysfunctional avoiders with uh, negative workup, no, no secondary cause, and, uh, and the families are, are highly motivated and basically forcing them to get uh, uh, interest in. And uh, they, they found quite a high response rate. And uh, these kids had, had a wide variety of complaints, and uh, they looked at these complaints uh, after, uh, after interstim and, and found quite a uh, significant response. So it, it looks like interstim may uh, be um, useful in the uh, refractory dysfunctional 
uh, voider um, in pediatrics. So we've gone through some of the clinical stuff and just wanted to see if anyone has any questions at this point before we move on and talk about some neurophysiology and uh, things like that. I, I actually don't know what the price is. Uh, as we go forward with the i and Mark will be able to uh, answer on this, is that uh, have we been tracking the number of patients in BC that have been sent out of the province for uh, uh, test uh, stimulation and use that as a initial argument to revisit having sent of excellence for this in British Columbia? Uh, you know, I've had one patient that sent them with the new path that they're in retention like in Calgary. Uh, and that seems to be, the, the money involves the patient, I understand. And so is there any way to subtract that? Second of all, is that what is the number of augmentation system proxies that were doing in, in, you know, in BC and whether or not any of those would have been avoided if we, uh, for the severe uh, frequency of emergency patients, uh, uh, is hard for really you to do most of the augmentation system proxies in our hospital. I'm not exactly sure how many people are being sent out, but certainly they're being sent out. I mean, uh, we've all had probably one case a year that gets, uh, you know, people out of this point that get sent out. There's not a lot of augmentation system plans that they don't think they're being done, at least by the most time. Maybe at the most, maybe 60 years or so. And so, overall, the problem is not a huge impact, but certainly if we could, you know, uh, treat some of these people with much of uh, the neuromodulation, then that would be a But we're raising we're this has been around a long time, and there's still not a huge amount of literature, and there's still not good indications, and there's, you know, there's still a lot of things that are unknown. So certainly, I think it's a it's a worthwhile area to explore, and probably more on the research, the clinical investigation side, and the clinical side. I think the, the current indications are um, they're limited. Uh, I think mainly for for safety reasons, they're, they're very kind of set limited uh, indications for people without neurogenic uh, bladders. But I think as we start to get more data in that area, it may be used in people with spinal cord injuries and MS and things like that. But um, the the big randomized series that I was discussing before, they excluded all those neurogenic patients, and so never really. It's more of an off-label indication now, but Maybe it'll become more accepted, but. Okay, so for those of us that are still awake, we'll talk a bit about some neurophysiology and then the mechanism, of what we know about the mechanism of neuromodulation. So I'll try to whiz through uh, this, just the, uh, the anatomy of the, of the uh, nerves to the lower urinary tract. There's basically three types of uh, efferent pathways to so the bladder and, and uh, sphincter. Um, they're either autonomic or, or somatic. And um, the autonomic pathways are um, the sacral parasympathetics or the uh, thoracolumbar sympathetics. And um, these are, this just kind of summarizes where, where they originate. The parasympathetics run through the pelvic plexus, uh, which is the perirectal plexus, as do the sympathetics. Uh, and the somatic nerves, uh, same um, roots, uh, but they run through uh, uh, the pudendal nerve, which takes a different course and uh, they have slightly different functions. Um, the somatic nerves are, of course, under um, voluntary control um, in terms of their motor function and, and affect the sphincter. Uh, so this is the uh, perirectal uh, uh, plexus taking um, roots from S234 and going up towards the uh, bladder and uh, outlet. Uh, so uh, the afferent pathways, the pathways coming back, uh, are also either somatic or autonomic. Um, the somatic pathways are mainly from uh, the, the external uh, sphincter and then the pelvic uh, viscera, and those are all along the uh, pudendal nerves. The autonomic afferents are basically what senses bladder distension and nociception. And of note, um, the, uh, the C fibers... Uh, have gotten a lot of uh, talk uh, in, in recent years and uh, these are fibers that are located in the mucosa and smooth muscle of the bladder and they're there to sense uh, noxious stimuli uh, 
and actually stimulate a reflex to, to, to void. Um, it's kind of a protective mechanism to get rid of any um, toxins and whatnot. Um, mostly they're silent, but uh, in various disease states they can become recruited and it can become mechanosensitive at low thresholds and actually uh, can, can uh, stimulate uh, reflex voiding um, uh, at low uh, threshold and they're implicated in detrusor overactivity and they're a therapeutic target uh, for overactive bladder either pharmacologically or with neuromodulation. Uh, central pathways, there, we, there's a lot more to it than we actually know, uh, but you can divide it into the, the cortex, which uh, senses bladder fullness, puts the uh, voiding function into a social context, uh, can kind of turn the spinal reflexes on or off depending on the social circumstance. Uh, the ponti micturation center, which just coordinates your bladder and your outlet, and the spinal cord, which is the interface between the higher centers and the uh, uh, efferent pathways to the bladder and outlet. And uh, the efferents to the, uh, to the bladder uh, and outlet uh, can be affected either by uh, descending signals centrally, so these are voluntary central signals, signals or they can be uh, reflexogenically or reflexively um, uh, stimulated by afferent uh, peripheral input from the bladder or outlet. So the bladder is kind of a unique organ because it is a visceral organ uh, with autonomic innervation that is under voluntary control. So nothing else like that. Um, so talking about the reflexes, the bladder is constantly in a seesaw battle between storage and voiding. It's storage is winning 99% of the time and then we override that every now and then. So the storage is a passive uh, mode and uh, the reflex for storage is completely contained within uh, the periphery and spinal cord. There's not really much um, uh, uh, cent centrally going on there. We're not telling ourselves to store. Uh, only in times of uh, trying to suppress the voiding reflex are we kind of voluntarily um, storing. And uh, emptying is uh, actually, uh, actually the reflex. Um, once we get the signal to that we uh, need to empty from the spinal cord, it goes up to the ponti micturation center, which coordinates the, uh, the bladder and the outlet, resulting in uh, synergic uh, voiding. And this is stimulated by high intensity afferent signals from the bladder from, uh, from, a, from a lot of volume in there. And uh, there are interneurons uh, that act as an interface between efferent and, uh, afferent and efferent pathways and also that act as an interface between um, somatic uh, pathways and autonomic pathways. So neuromodulation basically um, relies on the fact that uh, the somatic, autonomic, and central pathways all converge in the sacral uh, cord. And if you kind of stimulate one pathway, which in neuromodulation happens to be the somatic afferent pathway, you can, mod you can kind of affect the other pathways because they're all kind of in the same place and the interneurons allow them to communicate. This is basically uh, gate control theory. So um, what is known about neuromodulation, it's known that um, uh, efferent outflow to the, to the uh, bladder and outlet is activated by, um, we, sorry, we talked about that, um, is it activated either by per, um, peripheral afferents or central signal, voluntary signal. And we know this, uh, that um, you can kind of slow your, your bladder reflex down, uh, you know, with a, uh, with a, like a Vincent's curtsy in a kid or, or doing a Kegel will kind of get your bladder to slow down in times when you're, when you're full. And this is uh, um, kind of the idea behind neuromodulation. It actually triggers the uh, somatic afferent signal. Um, and we know that it specifically triggers uh, the somatic afferent because, um, because of the actual uh, parameters of the, of the neurostimulation. It doesn't, uh, uh, it's too, uh, uh, low, it's under the threshold to stimulate any other of, the, of those nerves. It doesn't uh, meet the criteria to, to stimulate any of the autonomics or, uh, or actually motor nerves. So it doesn't, doesn't do anything directly to the motor nerves controlling the bladder or the outlet. And after stimulating the afferent um, somatic uh, pathway, this has secondary effects. This has effects on the autonomic efferents to the to the bladder and outlet, uh, 
um, and this is an indirect uh, pathway and has uh, also effects on other autonomic uh, e afferent uh, pathways, the C fibers and the A delta fibers, and it may have effects secondarily higher up uh, in the brain and brain stem possibly. And some of these changes may be chronic and induce neuroplasticity. And uh, it's proposed that uh, there may be a chronic effect in the, actually the pelvic floor and the, the sphincter. You may get chronic physiologic changes. Uh, again, you may get neuroplasticity, chronic central changes, and it may even enhance uh, nerve regeneration. And uh, this is through neurotrophin secretion. This is some of the work that's being done in um, neurostim neuromodulation for uh, ED, um, particularly in post-prostatectomy uh, people. Uh, so how does uh, neuromodulation work for the specific disorders it's indicated for? Uh, it kind of implies that it, it says something about the, the mechanism of the disease itself. So for overactive bladder, it's proposed that there's an increased uh, C-fiber afferent signaling and r this triggers reflex voiding. Uh, and there also may be altered central inhibition of this voiding reflex. So it's proposed that neuromodulation inhibits the, the C-fiber-mediated uh, overactive afferent firing, and this indirectly inhibits the parasympathetic uh, reflex signal to the, to the bladder, and it may also reestablish central inhibition. So the known effects of, um, of uh, neuromodulation, it's known to, to inhibit the afferents, um, and uh, there's some evidence that uh, there's no that there's no direct stimulation of uh, any efferents to the pelvic floor. It was thought that maybe neuro neurostimulation gets you to gets the pelvic floor to, to spasm, uh, and that just increases uh, resistance and stops uh, voiding in, in uh, overactive bladder. But that's been uh, disproven. And um, there is some functional MRI evidence that there's some central um, uh, stimulation going on with uh, with neuromodulation, and this is. Uh, uh, likely an indirect pathway. And the question is, is does it induce chronic changes or neuroplasticity? Um, in idiopathic retention, the proposed pathophysiology is uh, that uh, the brain can't turn off uh, the guarding reflex, which is uh, a reflex to, to maintain, to keep dry in times of abdominal, increased abdominal pressure, laughing, sneezing. Uh, and that needs to be turned off uh, when you're gonna avoid um, um, and also it's proposed that there's uh, pelvic floor spasm which leads to reflex inhibition of the detrusor which is essentially uh, DSD without the uh, injury. And uh, so it's proposed that um, uh, neuromodulation uh, inhibits uh, the guarding reflex uh, through the afferent limb, stabilizes the pelvic floor uh, which uh, which allows the detrusor to uh, to contract, and it may also centrally activate the pontine micturition center, which will uh, stimulate voiding. Uh, and then, in terms of uh, chronic pelvic pain, um, it's basically just gate control theory. There, it's thought that uh, chronic pelvic pain would also be kind of overactivity in, in C fibers, um, and uh, and Basically, if you stimulate uh, pudendal afferents, uh, this would inhibit uh, firing of, of the uh, C fibers through interaction through inter interneurons in uh, the spinal cord. And that's about it for uh, for mechanism there. Okay, we'll just conclude the. Uh,